This is Zanzibar, and this is the story of the revolution. In the People's Palace, the Council of the Revolution now rules where Sultan Jamshid and his ancestors used to reign. Above the Battle El Jai, now as before the seat of executive government, flies the revolutionary emblem with the white vertical stripe for harmony of the People's Republic of Zanzibar. The revolutionaries have put the familiar white sports card of the Sultan Jamshid at our disposal, together with an armed guard. That big yellow building coming up on our left is the former headquarters of the ZNP, the Zanzibar Nationalist Party, the former ruling party, mixed Arab and African, led mostly by Arabs, now overthrown and declared illegal. That's where much of the fighting occurred in the early morning of Sunday the 12th of January. The essential point to grasp is that there were two revolutionary plots and not one. There may have been more than two, but there were at least two. Plot number one was by the leaders of the Afro-Shirazi party. Probably not Abayd Kurumi, the party president, who is a cautious man. More likely by his deputy, Hanger, who is now vice president of the republic. This plot was organized by politicians. It was supported by some, at least, of the leading politicians in Tanganyika. It relied on outside assistance and was backed also by some left-wing revolutionary Arabs. It was timed for a week after the actual coup. Plot number two was O'Kello's. This was exclusively African, had no assistance from the mainland, and although some of the conspirators, including O'Kello himself, had had minor party office in the Afro-Shirazi party, they included no generally known politician. O'Kello did not trust anyone who was not a purebred African or any political leader. He got to hear of the date of plot number one and was pretty certain that the politicians between them would make a mess of it. He therefore struck one week in advance of the date of the other plot. Midnight. One of the opposition Afro-Shirazi politicians, now in the cabinet, is woken up in his house, a gun is pointed at his stomach, a bow and arrow at his head. He is told that the revolution is going off in three hours' time. He must tell the revolutionaries where they can find people who can work Zanzibar radio. 3 a.m., January the 12th, Okeno personally knocked out an African sentry outside the armory at the Zuwani police station with his fist, grabbed the man's rifle in best commando style, then knocked out the next man. Thus, the revolutionaries had guns and ammunition by 3.30 a.m. Virtually, the game was over. There was no Zanzibar army, and the police was disarmed. European police officers had recently been reduced from 26 to 6. Their chief, Commissioner Sullivan, rallied the remains of his force at the Melindi police station. He had one other European regular officer, six specials, and about 80 men. Between them, they had five rifles. They broke into a sports store, got two twos and shotguns. They let one revolutionary truck get right to the end of this bridge before intercepting it. The revolutionaries fled and the police won 15 more rifles, but they had still no reserve of ammunition. The Sultan and his family had plenty of time in which to get away, which they did first on this small yacht and then on that larger one which was wireless back from Tanga. Why didn't the ministers also get onto a boat? No one really knows. They had plenty of opportunity and were urged to do so by their European civil servants. The police commissioner's position was now hopeless at Melindi, but the rebels still did not attack. From the community centre at Rahaleo, which incorporates the radio station, Okello directed the battle. His violent speeches, extravagant bragging, bloodthirsty threats were part psychological warfare. After all, the Arabs still in the rural areas were well armed. All the same, they must have contributed to the terrible holocaust of casualties, running almost certainly into four figures, nearly all of them Arab. The sins of the Arab fathers, who had owned Africans as slaves and caused the most appalling wastage of human life in capturing them throughout East and Central Africa, had been visited terribly on the third and fourth generations. It's only fair to add that Okello used the same propaganda methods to protect the lives and property of Europeans, none of whom was hurt. People in the town hastily tied handkerchiefs on their arms and hung them from their doors and windows to signify surrender to the new regime. The Afro-Shirazi political leaders gathered in Dar es Salaam. Karumi, Hanger, and Babu heard over the radio they'd be made president, vice president, foreign minister. They borrowed a reconditioned iron lifeboat with a glass bottom for tourists to see the fishes that was awaiting repairs. Concrete was poured into its holes, and its owner piloted the cabinet through the coral reefs into Zanzibar and power. 
From now on, the story that we tell is one-sided. This is the Council of Revolutionaries. We were not allowed to interview their opponents. They are still in prison. Mr. President, what were the factors which made you decide that a revolutionary action would be necessary? In the first place, the former government did not represent the majority interest of the people. It's obvious that how can an opposition party with 54% of the electorate voting for the opposition and only 46% voting for the established government, just obvious that there was some hanky-panky going on. <laughs> by what means? <laughs> by, what, by what means was Field Marshal O'Kelly chosen as the leader of the Revolutionary Army? Mongozi and now Ben and Hawa were to vote him. Because of his experience and the leadership which is popular to the people who organized the, the... Where did he get his previous military experience from? He said he was trained here by the God of the Africans, gained experience through the God of the Africans, and we succeeded through the God of the Africans. Um, Sheikh Barber, it's no, no uh, news to you that there is considerable speculation as to whether the communists were behind this rising, and your name is, is associated with that. Can I, can I ask you to tell me frankly, to what extent did you get communist assistance, financial or otherwise? None at all. There was no communist uh, uh, help. We were helped by the God of Africans, and uh, except some a clique of people, uh, foreigners who happened to come from Arabia, were helped by some of the Western powers uh, uh, in, uh, in crushing us, particularly Britain. Yes, that's correct. Sheikh Baba, you know very well that the uh, ZNP, of which you were formerly the General Secretary, was always accusing the British of being on the side of the African <laughs> 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 It is, it is fairly well known that uh, that is not true. And uh, actually, uh, the British government didn't help the Afro-Shiraz right? Is it not the case that the ZNP did use to accuse the British government of this? That's the I think that is correct. That was stated. That's politics. <laughs> Why did you, as a matter of fact, change sides, Sheikh Baba? Mm -hmm. I, I, I was attracted by the ZNP with its program, which I thought was for the good of the whole entire people of the country. But when I realized that this program was never intended to put, be put in practice, and instead they put me in prison, <laughs> <laughs> so I decided that this was not uh, uh, an honest party and decided to be on the side of the, uh, of the angels. <laughs> uh, Sheikh Babu, did you yourself know that there was going to be a revolution? Uh, I never knew. I know the women are going to do a revolution now. You were in Dar es Salaam yes. when the revolution took place. Right. What was the first news you got of it? Uh, the first news of, I got of it was the government is, is collapsing, that the armory was taken and the two police stations were, were taken over. That was the first news I heard of the revolution. There was a Cuban uh, consulate, I think, or embassy recently opened in Dar es Salaam. Do you think that had anything to do with the revolution? I have absolutely nothing, because he, he also was taken by surprise. And he asked you what was happening? Yes, he asked me what was happening in Zanzibar, and I had no, nothing to You didn't know either? I didn't know either. <laughs> I was just as ignorant as he was. Brilliant couple of innocents. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, things in Zanzibar are getting back to a kind of normal. There's a noticeable absence of tourists, none are now allowed to land, or of Arabs in the streets, many of them are still in detention camps. Many of the Europeans, particularly those with senior civil service appointments, are packing up to go. But some still remain, and they are safe. They're even racing their sailing boats from the sailing club. <laughs> 